The Sahara is the largest hot desert in the world, and the third largest desert behind Antarctica and the Arctic, which are both cold deserts. The Sahara is one of the harshest environments on Earth, covering 9.4 million square kilometers, nearly a third of the African continent, about the size of the United States. For several hundred thousand years, the Sahara has alternated between desert and savanna grassland in a 41,000-year cycle. Caused by the precession of the Earth's axis as it rotates around the Sun, which changes the location of the North African monsoon. The area is next expected to become green in about 15,000 years. But what if we could create a sea in the Sahara that could bring humid air, rain, and agriculture deep into the desert? The possibility of such a project was raised several times by different scientists and engineers during the late 19th century and early 20th century, primarily from European colonial powers in Africa. Because the Sahara has many areas below the sea level with water access from the Atlantic Ocean or Mediterranean Sea. The idea of flooding basins and depressions in the Sahara Desert gained a serious note. In 1877, a Scottish entrepreneur Donald Mackenzie was the first to propose the creation of a Sahara Sea. Mackenzie's idea was to cut a channel to El Jew from Atlantic Ocean. He proposed that this inland sea, if augmented with a canal, could provide access to the Niger River and the markets and rich resources of West Africa. But this project didn't happen for its own reasons. In 1878 two French men, Francois Ali Raudaire, and Ferdinand de Lesseps, proposed that a channel be cut from the Gulf of Gabas in the Mediterranean to the Shah al Fijaj, which would allow the sea to drain into these basins. They believed that the new inland sea would improve the quality of weather on the European continent. The estimated cost of the Raud Air project was $30 million at the time. While Raud Air and Dilaseps were optimistic about the weather effects that such an inland sea would produce in Europe, others were not as hopeful. The project was ultimately rejected by the French government and funding was withdrawn. When surveys revealed that many areas were not below sea level as had been believed. Another such project was the Cotera Depression project, which gained importance in the 20th century. The Cotera Depression is a region that lies 60 meters below sea level on average, and is currently a vast uninhabited desert. By connecting the region and the Mediterranean Sea, with tunnels or canals, water could be let into the area. The inflowing water would then evaporate quickly because of the desert climate. This way a continuous flow of water could be created, if inflow and evaporation were balanced out. With this continuously flowing water, hydroelectricity could be generated. But eventually, this would result in a hypersaline lake, or a salt pan, as the water evaporates and leaves the salt it contains behind. This would return the Cotera Depression to its current state but with its Sebka soils, tens of meters higher. But the core problem of the project, was the cost and technical difficulty of diverting sea water to the depression. Calculations showed that digging a canal, or tunnel would be too expensive. For example, large-scale demining would be needed, to remove millions of unexploded ordnance, left from World War II. Consequently, the use of nuclear explosives, to excavate the canal was another proposal by Basler. This plan called for the detonation, in boreholes of 213 nuclear devices, each yielding, 1.5 megatons that is 100 times that of the atomic bomb used against Hiroshima. Evacuation plans cited numbers of at least 25,000 evacuees. The shock waves from the explosion might also affect the tectonically unstable, Red Sea Rift. Located just 450 kilometers away from the blast site. Another danger was increased coast erosion because sea currents could change in such a way, that even very remote coastal areas would erode. Because of the concerns about using a nuclear solution, the Egyptian government turned down the plan, and the project's stakeholders gave up on the project. After several years the project regained steam in the mid-2010s, with the creation of the Association Cooperation Road, which in 2018 obtained the approval of the Tunisian government.